Hello, welcome to another Tomless Landscape oil painting demonstration and welcome as well to the Mastering Georgia Nest series. This is day two and the painting that uh, we did a study after of Georgia's was called Afterglow on the Meadow. And I don't have any idea what size painting his was but mine was done as an 8x10 on a textured board. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, texture of the board, I mean the color, basically kind of an ochre slash raw sienna tone. And there was a couple things I wanted to do on this, but um, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about this series and where we're at. So we're on day two, day one's up, it's on the blog. Um, there's a link to the blog underneath the video. Um, this painting will also be for sale in my store, which, you know, is pretty easy to get to from the blog as well. Um, but there'll be a link for that primarily underneath, um, and for two ninety nine. So a, a very uh, I price these to sell and to um, be affordable for people. So if you find you're really resonating with this particular piece, go for it. Um, but any support is uh, appreciated, of course. Also, the live version of this painting um, uh, being done is in the members area. Uh, contains a color mixing session. And a basically kind of blow by blow where I go through the reference image. But by the way, you don't need to be a part of the members area to have access to this mem a reference image either. If you want to make your own study, that will be in the blog post. So it'll be underneath uh, at the bottom of the post. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about this painting. So it really looked to me to be very loose and sketchy on the part of Vanessa. It is a late period painting. It's from 1890. And he passed away about uh, three years after that. Now, um, that reminds me. <laughs> I'm going to be reading from a book by Nikolai Chiskowski. And sorry, I'm not pronouncing his name right. Really good book called Georgia Ness that came. Went with a large retrospective show that was making the rounds in the 80s. Um, his last name is spelled C-I-K-O-V-S-K-Y uh, Jr. Uh, Nikolai and um, really awesome book you can get it used I doubt it's I think it's way out of print but nice color reproductions especially for that era and um, all of the uh, paintings in the Ness uh, series will I'll, I'll, I'll be finding something to read about him from all of my books and we'll see how we do when we get to day 130 but I'm sure I'll keep well, at that point, if I repeat something, who's going to know, right? Maybe you'll know. Maybe you'll be a big fan. I'm a, certainly a huge fan of George, and that's one of the reasons I'm going after basically a study a week. Yeah. So, um, it was very loose, his painting, um, and my board was very textured, and um, I enjoy working on smooth. I also enjoy working on the textured. Um, maybe the smooth a bit more these days, but um, uh, so I thought, well, what can I do? What can I do? And what I decided to do was to work quite a bit thicker with my paint than I usually do. So I modified my painting technique a bit to lay down more pigment. And of course that slowed things down uh, as well. I mean, I could have, there's not much detail in this scene. Um, it's pretty wide open. Um, oh, another thing I should mention, and I go over this uh, quite thoroughly in the members area and my reasons why, I have modified his scene. His horizon line was higher by nearly three quarters of an inch, and uh, I just didn't like it. So I changed it. Sorry, George. Um, like I said, though, I, don't <clears throat> I think this is a very awesome painting from him um, that I went after. But uh, it, that was an issue that bothered me, so I just lowered, lowered it to what I thought he maybe uh, if he'd had another chance to take a crack at it, he would have done, which was to make the horizon line dead center, uh, which is something he did in painting after painting after painting, which is something a lot of painters teach you not to do, but uh, he certainly did it successfully time and time again, so I, I, I certainly don't hesitate to do the same. Yeah. Um, laying on paint thicker uh, really takes more time, it eats up more paint, but you know if you're a new painter you should be aware that oil paint has a tendency to become a bit 
more transparent with age so um, especially if you're working on a real dark ground or a dark surface it's something to be aware of that you probably want to lay that paint on a little thicker than um, you might think yeah it's just a tip for you there um, so I did my draw drawing uh, with a modified version of um, uh, it was brown ochre mostly yeah in fact I don't even know if I modified it to be honest I might have added a little bit of burnt sienna to it um, but uh, I didn't change it that much and it worked very well a uh, reason being is that he really has very very few darks or high contrast in this painting so clearly that was one of the parameters he set up and um, just for for your sake too uh, you know if you're a painter and, and I, I know a lot of people that are painters watch this channel I'm sure, sure I know some people actually who are not painters watch the channel as well just because they find it relaxing um, it's a good thing to do sometimes to set up parameters like I set up he had he had set up a lot of the parameters like okay I'm not gonna have any super dark high contrast shapes um, really that that mound in the middle of trees that tree mass that's basically the darkest thing there are a few strokes here and there that are black um, but not enough to really justify black as being an actual mixed color on this uh, painting, you know, um, in my premix session. Yeah. Um, so he had that parameter set up, but one of the parameters I set up was like, well, I'm going to do this very thick, very thick, which is not my usual way to work. Usually I just try to work thick enough that uh, we won't be running into this transparency issue I just outlined. Yeah. Anyway, um, as you're watching me paint here, let me go ahead and get into some of this book. Now we're on page um, 47, which is basically the uh, intro chapter. Um, I just picked a start a paragraph at uh, the bottom here. Um, when asked the objective of art, Ines replied, simply to reproduce in other minds the impression which a scene has made upon the artist. A work of art does not appeal to the intellect, it does not appeal to the moral sense. Its aim is not to instruct, not to edify, but to awaken an emotion. This emotion may be one of love, of pity, of veneration, of hate, of pleasure, or of pain. It must be a single emotion if the work has unity, as every such work should have. And the true beauty of the work consists in the beauty of the sentiment or emotion which it inspires. Its real greatness consists in the quality and force of this emotion. <clears throat> that was a quote from George, uh, going on to what the author, author wrote. Um, the artist's subjective experience of nature and his ability to communicate the emotions that nature evokes are now the whole point of landscape painting. So he's, he's talking about this evolution of landscape painting in the uh, 1800s and uh, in previous uh, part of the chapter he was referencing the pre-Raphaelites and their uh, uh, love of intense detail which is astounding I love the pre-Raphaelites in fact my student was just showing me some work today uh, that she's going after and I'm like yeah you can't do better if you're a narrative type uh, painter that's into a more illustrative thing uh, than the pre-Raphaelites they're absolutely astounding um, speaking as a former illustrator, I have a, a whole other um, objective as a painter, uh, which is very much in line with uh, what George uh, has outlined in his quote. Um, I will say, though, that most of the emotions that he outlined there are not ones you're going to want to paint to sell paintings. Um, generally, a feeling of reverence or tranquility is um, what I'm going for um, and it doesn't need to be spelled out I don't think that has to happen overtly I think you can feel it and then communicate the feeling you don't actually have to attach a word to it like reverence or you know something like that um, uh, something I'm doing as I'm searching for words uh, for the sorts of emotions that I'm trying to convey or even that say he was trying to convey in this scene you know Anyway, let's read a little bit more. Uh, the whole point of landscape being no longer a diligent drudge of the craftsman doomed to lose against the photograph. The contest of producing in, 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 in any case inferior facsimile of reality, the artist was now expected to be a poet who felt the mysterious beauty 
that an objectively recording camera could never see unless I were a pictorialist um, <laughs> many changes in subject matter and approach naturally followed from this fundamental reorientation and this is a great um, we'll leave it there for now um, something I teach all the time to my students and um, you know let's consider you to be a bit of a student of mine while you're watching this video um, if you're working with photographs and photographic reference um, so often I see uh, people make you know these very diligent copies of the photo and in some cases it comes off and, and, and I did the very same thing myself when I was first starting out I didn't know any better you know um, and some people really liked those paintings some people uh, bought those paintings however they were not as successful as a painting like we're looking at here today um, and therefore not as valid that's just my opinion so I'm not really trying to diss anyone that's in the photorealistic painting but we already have cameras so you know we already have filters for cameras uh, like in, in, in programs like Instagram and things like that so it seems to me that the real mission of the artist is the same mission that George Ines went after which is creating and evoking uh, a response an emotive response to the landscape how it makes you feel and um, you know capturing that in paint uh, communicating that to the observer um, it's rewarding and <clears throat> I've mentioned this on the channel before but um, you know if you know where I came from as a art young artist I was very much into things like comic books and um, my, uh, I was very much into things like doing very detailed drawings and things and pen and ink work um, and then when I got my gig as an illustrator mostly I was doing animals or dinosaurs or cartoony type um, uh, you know animals uh, all kinds of icons things like that um, graphic icons not religious icons um, but you know ultimately I wanted to become a landscape painter because in my 20s was when I was a picture framer which was maybe the the great age of the poster right um, some of the poster prints that we would sell would be these Austin landscape paintings uh, that were so beautiful and so relaxing to look at and I had several that I purchased and had up on the wall of my apartment and when I come home after working uh, all day I would just you know sit there and take them in and I saw, and I saw that as being a very valid very valid reason to create art uh, to create something that people would find a, a place that they could go in with their mind and sort of be free to wander um, and it's for this reason I don't generally put a lot of figures in my landscapes although I really do like the approach that Ines uses to the figure and uh, if you look at the previous video you see I did a little landscape painting that was a 5x7 where I incorporated a similar type of figure it was in silhouette and it, it brought a lot to the painting um, uh, the thing is like it's a matter of scale though I think if the figure is quite small in proportion to the landscape uh, it really detracts from having too much of a narrative quality um, here you can see we slowed down the video a little just something I've started doing lately at the end of the videos just to kind of um, give you a sense of the it's not real time but this is only sped up about three and a half times so a little slower for you and uh, you know check out that uh, that members area you know if you want to go after some of the nest goodness and he really is the best I, I he's the best landscape painter that, that there is and this is one of the reasons why uh, we're going to be doing nearly 130 studies or possibly more I don't know um, and we're going to be recording and documenting the entire process uh, everyone will have access to this reference images on my blog and the ability of course to purchase the studies too um, which would be helpful because support is very valuable especially in this uh, day and age we uh, we know how um, you know a lot of people are struggling if you're somebody that's struggling a little less than uh, others um, and you love this piece go ahead and uh, purchase it I'll ship it to you uh, I pay for the shipping uh, free international shipping and it's satisfaction guaranteed that's my uh, policy without fail
anyway thank you for joining me today and uh, check out this uh, in the blog uh, there'll be an, a decent resolution uh, uh, picture of it and the video will be there and um, maybe some a little bit of background information and until I come back with another uh, video which will be one of my own paintings um, do me a favor do me a solid take good care of yourself your family all your loved ones uh, be patient with people who have opinions that differ from your own and um, stay out of trouble. God bless you and your family.